Hello, everybody. I'm so excited to be back. <laughs> and it's lovely seeing some familiar faces as well as some unfamiliar faces. Today, of course, we're going to be talking about the breast, but I am um, just a little um, uh, advertisement, let's say. Um, next time I'm speaking, we're moving down the body. So we've done hair, we've done eyes, we're doing breasts. So we're just going to more sensitive parts next time I speak on the day before. Um, Valentine's Day, I think it is, so you're all invited to that. But of course, today it is the breasts, and I'm going to take you back to the 21st of June, 1986. Um, on that day, nine American women removed their shirts in a park in New York. Now, they were protesting against a law that criminalized topless women, but not topless men. They chanted, Whatever we wear, wherever we go, yes means yes, no means no. And not the church, not the state, women will control our fate. Um, I have to admit that the placards um, contained less snappy slogans. Suppression creates obsession. What is indecent about our breasts and the worst of all is don't bust my bust. These demonstrations took place in front of hundreds of keen observers. Some were there to give support, of course, others were there simply to gawk. Despite the fact that no one made a complaint, seven of the women were arrested. In the court, Judge Waltz ruled that the state had a right to require that, in his words, the female breast must not, not be exposed in public places because community standards did not deem the exposure of male breasts offensive, but they did regard females' breasts as offensive. In other words, women's breasts were very different in terms of obscenity to male ones. Now, what I discovered, which I didn't know when I was writing this lecture, is that it was not always like that. I shouldn't be surprised since I'm a historian and that's what we always say. <laughs> anyway, men's nipples used to be as shocking as female ones. Indeed, it was illegal for men in many states of America to expose their breasts in public. The difference is, is that in the early 1930s, men decided that enough was enough. On the beaches in Coney Island, Westchester, Atlantic City, male swimmers stripped off their shirts and a nipple covering swimsuits. Other swimmers and sunbathers, as well as law enforcement agents and jurists, were actually outraged. The topless men were mocked. They were called, aren't they gorgeous? <laughs> aren't they gorgeous? Um, they were called gorillas. They were fined and threatened with arrest. One magistrate, magistrate rebuked them with the words, all of you fellows may be Adonis Dionysus, Donuthies. Um, but there are many people who object to seeing so much of the male body exposed. Luckily, shirtless men actually won that debate. By the end of the decade, these gorillas were free to flaunt their breasts and their nipples. Now today, men retain the right to walk around topless, but in the UK and many um, parts of the States, the female breast remains taboo in public places. Indeed, unlike our counterparts in um, many parts of continental Europe, no mention of Brexit here, Britons and Americans still seem rather um, alarmed by the female breast. Facebook is censoring photographs of breastfeeding babies breastfeeding mothers. Um, Instagram claims that pictures of women's nipples are instances of abuse. There was a public outcry when Janet Jackson's nipple was inadvertently revealed during a televised Super Bowl game in Los Angeles uh, 2004. The costume malfunction led to hearings before committees in the US House of Representatives and the Senate. Michael Powell, cha chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, maintained that it was just the latest in a growing list of deplorable incidents. 
He complained that, I share the displeasure and fatigue of millions of Americans about the erosion of common decency on television. The CBS was fined more than half a million dollars by the FCC, and a five-second delay on live broadcasts was introduced. Now, I'm interested in this hullabaloo because it's really interesting in the sense, really baffling, if we kind of note that CBS and other channels, all the other channels, routinely linger over the breasts of poor black women in the global south as they breastfeed their infants during famines. American families also, um, those who are outraged at seeing Janet Jackson's uh, breast, they routinely subscribe to National Geographic magazine with its staple of topless, dark-skinned women. Clearly, not all breasts are the same. Why is catching a very, very brief glimpse of the breast of an African-American celebrity on a stage in Los Angeles regarded as scandalous? while poring over arty black and white photographs of semi-naked women in the Sudan during humanitarian crises is unexceptional. And how can we explain, um, and I do not know how to explain, that peculiarly British phenomenon, although it was exported, by the way, to 97 countries in the world, um, of the Benny Hill Show. Some of you are too young to remember it. You are lucky. <laughs> um, Benny Hill Show, his skits frequently included women with large breasts, or knockers, as Hill would have it, and men with balloons stuck up their jumpers. This, by the way, was one of the most watched TV programs in Britain at the time, between the 1950s and the 1970s, one of the most popular. Um, audiences of 21 million a week. Okay? Now, in popular culture, too, Breasts are routinely lapooned. Novelty shops would uh, sell blown-up plastic breasts to be used as bath pillows or as soap dispensers. Breasts are called boobs, which means stupid, he's a boob, and tits, people make a titter themselves. They are balubas. Melons, bee stings, jugs, milk floats, and one I've never heard but I'm reliably told is used in the States, they are John Wayne's saddlebags. <laughs> I think that must be just American, I really do. Okay, in earlier times, thank goodness, earlier times, here's some good news, um, breasts were treated with more respect. After all, humanity itself has been classed with the mammals, amongst the mammals, the word, of course, means of the breast. The father of biological taxonomy, 18th century biologist Carl uh, Linnaeus, divided animals into these six classes. Humans were grouped with other animals who possess milk-producing um, mame. Linnaeus, um, his tax taxonomical placement of humans in this category was in fact not at all inevitable. After all, I mean we just doesn't take much to know this, milk producing breasts is only one of the characteristics of mammals and the maime are, as the historian of science Lunda um, Scheibinger reminds us, they are actually only functional in half of this group of animals. In other words, females, and amongst those for relatively short periods of time, if at all, in other words, during lactation. Interestingly, Linnaeus went one step further. Humans, he maintained, were mammals. Our milk-producing breasts link us to other members of the animal kingdom. But when he set out to distinguish humans from the rest of mammals, he invented the term homo sapiens, or man of wisdom. In other words, Linnaeus and subsequent uh, biologists, um, for, for Linnaeus and subsequent biologists, what ties humans to the rest of the animal kingdom is feminine, but what distinguishes humans from other 
Mammals is masculine, it's wisdom, it's intelligence. Women is an animal, man, the exemplary human. Now, Carl Linnaeus, um, his, his way of thinking of the world and dividing up the world, uh, were part of a wider series of debates in the 18th century about human breasts. One of the most prominent of these scientific debates is, well, why do human men have breasts at all? There were two responses, historically, to that question. First was to point out that some men do have breasts that produce milk. I'm going to return to this point later. The second response was to, scientific response I'm talking about, was to make this link between breast milk and blood. 18th century physician aligned himself with Aristotle's argument that breast milk was concocted blood. So in other words, women secrete blood as menstrual fluid. When pregnant, this blood nurtures the, the fetus. When she gives birth, this blood is converted into milk, breast milk. So breast milk is concocted blood. Shai Bingo explains, according to these scientists, 18th century scientists, with the onset of puberty, blood surges through the female body, causing the young women's breasts to inflate. The passion of love, also experienced at this age, causes them to inflate further. Men do not have menses, and therefore their breasts, though anatomically similar to women, never inflate. It's a sad, sad story. Um, <laughs> um, men's vestigial teat was also believed to support Plato's view that mammals were originally um, hermaphrodites and only later developed into distinct male and female. This was the view of Erasmus Darwin. His grandson, Charles Darwin, also argued that in early evolutionary time, the breasts of male mammals had been capable of producing breast milk. But this had eventually ceased, perhaps because they had began to have smaller litters, which rendered male assistance in nurturing infants unnecessary. We've heard that before, haven't we? <laughs> Anything to render it less necessary. Anyway, um, male breasts therefore joined other organs, such as the appendix or the tailbone, as vestigial organs. Now clearly, the way people have understood um, breasts varies dramat has varied dramatically. In many civilizations, here I'm thinking about the pre-Greek um, ancient world, breasts were sacred they produced sustenance without which humanity would simply not survive. While ancient Greece revered the phallus over the breasts, the mammae organs came back into fashion um, between the 6th century BC and 1 century AD in both Jewish and Christian traditions. Again, this was because of their function in, in nurturing the future generations. It was only from the 15th century that breasts became erotic organs, became viewed as being primarily erotic organs. And by the 6th century, of course, it was even fashionable for women to wear gowns that exposed their breasts. But 18th century um, function in the sense of lactation again came to the fore leading to a drop in both the erotic and the religious symbolisms, symbolism of breasts. This continued into the 19th century with its renewed interest in uh, women as mothers. Postcards and paintings depicted sentimental portraits of large bosomed mothers breastfeeding their babies and this proliferated. By the 1890s, the breasts lactating and its sexual meanings were sheared apart. While 1920s women celebrated their sexy, relatively flat-breasted looks, pronatalist governments throughout Europe were keen to promote the more functional, lactating, breastfeeding aspects of female um, breasts. In all of these contexts, in all of these contexts, women's freedoms 
status, autonomy, um, were at stake. It was, after all, one thing to insist on the power of women as homemakers, or as mothers, whose breasts were the private objects of male heterosexual desire and occasionally functioned um, in the production of healthy infants. It was quite another thing for women to enter public life as women with breasts. Breasts have paid, paid, played powerful roles in female subordination. This can be illustrated by an anecdote from the original Star Wars film, 1977. In her memoir, Carrie Fisher, who played Princess Leia, um, or Leia, by the way, in the film is pronounced in two different ways. I'm going to stick with Leia because slightly more often in the film than, than Leah, but anyway. In her memoir, Carrie Fisher recalled being summoned by the director George Lucas, George Lucas to model what was to become Leia's um, iconic white dress. Lucas bluntly informed Fisher that she was not to wear a bra. Why? Because he said space was a underwear-free place. He explained that what happens is you go to space and you become weightless, but then your body expands, but your bra doesn't, so you get strangled by your own bra. It was a message that women have imbued for centuries. Being a woman with breasts means that any attempt to break into a male-dominated public culture will lead to our strangulation. When entering public life as women, breasts provide create problems. Now, this leads us to the inequity that only male members of humanity are allowed to wander topless in public spaces. The censorship of female breasts per perpetuate heterosexual men's definition of eroticism. Not only do men get to decide what is right for women, but if a woman does go topless, and if a man then is aroused by it, then she is guilty of lewd behavior. Um, this point was made explicit by Justice Payne in his findings during the 1991 trial, very important trial, of Gwyn Jacob, who walked through the streets topless in protest of the double standard that allows men, but not women, to be topless. Justice Payne contended that it was clear to me that the female breast constitutes a very personal and responsive part of the female anatomy and is a part of the female body that is sexually stimulating to men, both by sight and touch. As a result, he judged, women's breasts were not therefore a part of the body that ought to be exposed to public view. Now, of course, the law does allow the, for public exposure of some women's breasts in topless bars, for example, which are largely catering to male clientele, but not the breasts that belong to male lovers or husbands. In this way, women's bodies are objectified and sexualized. The preferences of women are themselves become secondary to those of heterosexual men who decide when and where female breasts can be displayed. Now, of course, eroticism of all kinds is to be celebrated, not disparaged. But as Brenda Helpy Schmeider points out in a fantastic article called The Constitution and so Societal Norms, A Modern Case for Female Breast Equality, came out in 2015, she, she argues, when eroticized body parts develop into the eroticization of a whole class of people, there is a danger that the class's sexuality um, overshadows that other aspects of that class. Heterosexual men's obsession with policing women's breasts is oppressive to the women that they profess to love. Now, there are other problems with the prohibition of female toplessness in public spaces. Obviously, it privileges the sexual fantasies of heterosexual men over though that of homosexual or queer men who might, in fact, find male chests profoundly arousing. 
it also ignores female arousal in at least two ways. First, many, most probably, women experience their own breasts erotically. Nipples respond to touch and to temperature. But women are only allowed to experience these sensations in the privacy of their home. Second, male chests are sexually exciting to many heterosexual women. This is not working. Let's, it's not even working on the pause button. <laughs> it's not working on this either. It's not working on that either. Oh, great. Thank you. Let's. Tr okay, there we go. Um, second. This is my favorite image. <laughs> Male chests are sexually interesting, exciting to many heterosexual women. In one survey, this is really interesting, I thought, when one survey when young women were asked which male body part was most sexually stimulating, 51% chose the chest, 23% the penis, 17% the legs, 9% the buttocks. However, and this is interesting, when the preferences were weighed, in other words, women's first, first, first choice was given four points, her second choice was given three, third point, etc. When that happens, the male chest was a outstanding winner, okay? followed not by the penis, but by the legs. Penis equal third to buttocks. So my point is, why shouldn't men cover up it is true that women's arousal to men's chest does not expose men to the risk of assault or rape, which is sometimes the consequence of male arousal to female chests. But why should responsibility for men's alleged uncontrollable desires be placed on women? The, messages project, the message that is projected by requiring women to cover their breasts in public is that female breasts are somehow shameful. And it's another way that the law deems women's bodies to be lesser, more lewd than men's. This not only makes women, some women, many women, feel uncomfortable in their own bodies, but it also denies her the opportunity to know what normal breasts look like, including the vast array of sizes, shapes, weights, colors. Heterosexual women may only have ever been exposed to the unrepresentative breasts of people, of women like Janet Jackson. Now, perfect breast um, shape, size, and angle can be faked, of course. Breasts have been supported by whalebone or steel they have been suspended by straps, compressed by bandages or rubber, separated by wires, ballooned by means of an inner shelf or firm elastic, and pushed each and every which way. Braziers replaced girdles from the 1920s. By 1932, S.H. Camp and Company introduced cup sizes, A, B, C, D, which, not surprisingly, were quickly referred to as egg cup, tea cup, coffee cup, and challenge cup. Whatever, whatever a woman's size, breasts, bras make breasts appear firmer, more conspicuous, and gives them, gives them a more spherical and conical shape. The commercialization of breasts has been and is big, big, big business. Women's anxieties have been used to sell pills, exercises, massages, creams, vibrating machines, hydrotherapy, suction devices, and so on and so on, all promising breast perfection. From the 1890s through to the 1900s, early 1900s, for example, Shears introduced, Shears department store, um, promoted the bust developer, it was a bestseller, um, complete with bust food. Um, and what one design historian called a metal object resembling a bathroom plunger. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the bust food guaranteed the finest nourishment for the bust glands, 
promising to create a plump, full, full, rounded bosom, which before was scrawny, flat, and flabby. <laughs> I wouldn't buy a product that referred to my, anyway. Another company which manufactured falsies drew on metaphors from the burgeoning car industry, boasting to women that we fix flats. <laughs> Surgery also promised, of course, to fix flats or to blow up the tires. From the 1980s, the American Society of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery was propagating the idea that flat-chested women were suffering from a disease. Um, micromastia, also called hypomastia or hypoplasia, was depicted as a scourge, scourge on women's lives and loves. 1982, the society could be heard arguing that the enlargement of the female breast was necessary for maintenance of health of, or treatment of disease. They claimed that small breasts were deformities. They were really a disease in which most patients, which in most patients results in feelings of inadequacy, lack of self-confidence, distortion of body image, and a total lack of well-being due to a lack of self-perceived femininity. Only surgery could provide these patients with a improved quality of life. Now, the history of taking knives to normal breasts is bracing. It all began in um, Heidelberg, 1895. Vinci Cherny conducted the first cosmetic implantations when he removed a tumor from a patient's back and sewed it into her chest. From the early 1900s, surgeons were transplanting silk, vegetable ivory from the ivory nut, paraffin, and polyvinylic alcohol sponges into healthy women's breasts. They mixed vegetable oils with silicone transformer coolant. They used saline solutions. By the early 1960s, Thomas Cronin and Frank Goh were promoting the first silicone implants. They were first tried out on a dog before being implanted in 1962. I'm um, sorry, not the same ones implanted, um, different ones implanted, um, um, into the breast of Timmy Jean Lindsay, a Texan factory worker who had come into their office um, simply wanting to have a tattoo removed. And she left, of course, with breast implants. Within a couple of decades, more than one million women had had the surgery. It's now a billion pound industry, with fathers, lovers, husbands, and even surgeons picking out the desired shape and size. These products and practices are not without risks. Operations last between one and two hours, leaving a two or three inch scar under each breast. Implants can leak or rupture. Indeed, one survey in the 1990s sh showed that, in fact, leaking leakages and ruptures occurred in 70% of breast of, of implants within 10 years. They often cause scar tissue, autoimmune disorders, nerve damage, fatigue, flu-like symptoms, swelling, loss of nipple sensation and chest pain. The fact that so many women are willing to undergo such risky procedures is a testament to the importance of breasts to um, the performance of femininity. It's helpful then to remind ourselves that the differential treatment of male and female breasts is not because female breasts are significantly different from male ones. At birth, the breasts of both girls and boys are the same. Both male and female breasts consist, consist of tissue, fat deposits, pectoral muscles, and memory glands. It's only at puberty that estrogen in women's bodies leads to the development of, of lobules, ducts, and uh, stromal tissue. The breasts of both sexes have the similar number of nerve endings and degree of elect erectile capacity, which is why male nipples are an extremely erogenous zone and are in fact as potentially erogenous as women's ones. Adult women do tend to have larger breasts than most men, but 
many women have small breasts and equally many men have large breasts, a phenomenon that's increasing as changing diets are causing the accumulation of fat and estrogen in men. Not surprisingly, male breast surgery is soaring. Furthermore, the ancient philosophers were not wholly wrong when they contended that some men produce breast milk. Between 30 and 60% of adolescent boys develop breasts capable of producing milk. Given the right hormones, progesterone, estrogen, oxytocin, prolactin, men can breastfeed. Liver cirrhosis, drugs such as the anti-psychotic drug thoranzine and the heart medication digozin and tumors that cause pituitary glands to overproduce prolactin also cause men to lactate. Starvation has a similar effect, although I don't recommend it. Um, even during the Second World War, for example, when prisoners of war were freed and provided with nutrition, um, you know, these are men who'd been starving sometimes you know, for, for years, when they were provided with nutrition, it was found that their livers were incapable of metabolizing estrogen and androgens, and their breasts began producing breast milk. However, male lactation is rare. Although it's, um, I, I, I have this fantasy of one day, you know, women and men will share that domestic task, <laughs> you know. Um, okay, um, it's going to be a while. Um, it's the ability of female breasts to lactate under certain conditions, obviously, um, that has generated some of the other heated debates about breasts. One of these debates is linked to the evolutionary discussions mentioned earlier. Did women evolve breasts as a result of natural or sexual selection? In other words, did the female of the species evolve breasts in order to attract men? In other words, sexual preference? Or to nurture infants? In other words, natural selection. Given that no other mammal sexually selects breasts, the answer probably lies in the latter, although scientists are totally divided over this. But if function is important for the species, then why are so many people phobic when mothers respond to nature's call in public places? And nature's call, I'm not talking about having a pee, um, I'm talking about something much more noisy. That is nature's call, the screaming, hungry infant. 2003, a report published in the Journal of the American Dietic, Di, 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 Dietic Society um, found that 37% of Americans believe that mothers who breastfed should only do so in private places. Those, in other words, who loudly chant, breast is best, often whisper to themselves, at home, please. This is strange, given the indisputable benefits of breastfeeding for both infants and mothers. Breast milk is great for immune systems. It has anti-inflammatory properties. Infants who are breastfed are less likely to develop respiratory problems, diabetes, leukemia, sudden infant death syndrome. Mothers who breastfeed have lower levels of breast than ovarian cancers, type two diabetes, and heart attacks. Both infants and mothers are at reduced risk of obesity. These benefits have been understood for centuries. When it was revealed that the mortality rate of infants admitted to the Dublin Foundling Hospital between 1775 and 1796 was over 99%. So in other words, of over 10,000 infants admitted to this hospital, only 45 did not die. And they were very aware of the reason. Verdict, death from want of breast milk. Two responses uh, were wet nursing and cross nursing. Um, we all know what wet nursing is. Cross nursing is less familiar, at least it wasn't, was to me. Um, in wet nursing, the, um, the infant is breastfed by someone who's not 
the infant's mother, but is usually employed by the infant's mother. Whereas cross-nursing is usually done between peers. Um, so it's often reciprocal. So I will breastfeed your baby, you will breastfeed my baby. Um, okay, admittedly, wet nursing um, was partly introduced to spare elite women the burden of carrying out this base task. In the words of the um, 18th century pediatrician, uh, Walter Harris, in De Morbis Actuis Infantum, um, it was to, wet nursing was to ensure that ladies of quality may have more time to dress receive and pay visits, attend public shows, and spend the night at their beloved cards. Does sound good. Um, but it did confer health benefits for lucky infants, albeit the cost of the wet nurses themselves and their infants. The message that breast is best was undercut by the promotion of artificial infant foods from the late 19th century onwards. Um, together with the opening up from the 1920s of other forms of employment for, um, for women, um, women who would otherwise have become wet nurses. The pasteurization of milk, increased knowledge about bacteria were also other factors that enhanced the popularity of artificial substitutes to breast milk. Now, breast is definitely best, but formidable barriers exist to its enactment. Stress, fear, painful nipples, illness such as HIV, drug, drug of dependence and unease with sexual feelings can all inhibit lactation. This is not to blame women or to blame mothers. Rather, it is to castigate broader structural processes that inhibit natural um, or healthy practices. It's no coincidence that poorer women and minority women are less likely to breastfeed. In one study, for example, only 16% of lower income mothers breastfed fed for six months. And there are many reasons for this, including the fact that although there are laws to provide job protected unpaid maternity leave for certain periods, many poor women or um, single mothers could not afford the time off. And many businesses, such as small ones, are exempt, and part-time workers, as well as women who have only recently joined um, a business, are not entitled. Poorer women are under financial pressure to get back to work, and they often have other children to care for. They are less likely to receive support and advice about breastfeeding. They lack access to medical knowledge about relactation, that is, you know, how to start lactation after it's stopped. And they are, to put it bluntly, simply exhausted. Negative public attitudes to breastfeeding in public is also a strong inhibiting factor, especially when a mother seeks to respond to the infant's needs rather than stick to a fixed meal schedule. Capitalist workplaces, these are designed for male bodies, not female ones and certainly not lactating ones. Mothers are expected to conform to the workplace rather than vice versa. As legal so scholar Chantal Moulton argues, women who breastfeed are viewed as disruptive and threatening because they refuse ownership, containment, and individuality by making explicit in a material way the social, political, and economic interrelationships that are intrinsic to conception, pregnancy, birth, and child raising, as well as the production of public and private spaces. Finally, contrary to the rhetoric of some advocates of breastfeeding, Breastfeeding is not free and not fun. It involves prodding, squeezing, and otherwise handling one's breasts and is a particularly exhausting form of female labor. Clearly, women have not responded passively to these assaults on our breasts, to the denigration of breasts 
to being treated differently to men and to the propagation of mixed messages. Breast is best. Not in public, please. They protested. Feminist picket picketing the Miss American pageant in Atlantic City in September 1968 through their bras in a rubbish in rubbish bins. Incidentally, no bras were ever burnt. <laughs> they put them in bins. Um, allowing their breasts to hang free was a powerful symbol of protest against patriarchal values which sought to mold women into a play um, girl image. Lactating mothers, wittily known as lactivists, mm, I love that, um, organized nurses, disrupting shops, restaurants, coffee bars, and airlines that had treated breastfeeding women wrongly or poorly. Breast Not Bombs is a political group who protests topless in an attempt to draw attention to the double standard um, relating to breasts, as well as, of course, the evils of war. Free the nipple campaigners are similarly annoyed that women can be placed on the sex offenders register for doing what most men do on the beach. As Lina Esco, instigator of the campaign, the Free the Nipple campaign, asked, the boob or nipple, it's the first thing you see when you're born. It's the thing you depend on. It's the thing that nourishes us. At what point did it become obscene? Similar initiatives include Go Topless, Top, Top Free Rights Association, Terra, and I love that Terra, and my favourite, the Outdoor Co-Ed Topless Pulp Fiction Appreciation Society, where topless women re um, read fiction, pulp fiction, um, in public places in New York, where female toplessness is legal. Typical protests include chants of free your breasts, free your minds, and a song, which I'm not going to sing, you'll be pleased to hear, and a song, Let Em Breathe, to the tune of Beatles' Let It Be. To conclude, legal restrictions on the public exposure of female breasts perpetuate harmful prejudices about women's role in society. They send powerful messages to women about their sexual objectification, their inferiority, and their place in public spheres. Breasts are not objects, but they are part of subjects. They belong to subjects. Only those subjects, women, should be allowed to say what it means for them and their freedoms. If we want to go topless in a park, we should not be sexually objectified. If we breastfeed in public, men should not blush. If we join Princess Leia in space, our bras should become sails, allowing us to fly high. Thank you very much.